So the Democratic debate just happened and a lot of people are really wondering the same thing. Who won? Who won the third Democratic debate? Well, it depends on what you define as winning. To me, there is only two things that really make a winner in this debate. You should only really have two objectives. The first one is name recognition. And the second one is very similar. That's brand recognition. When it comes to the debates, you should really try to accomplish these two things. And Andrew Yang surprisingly kind of did that. Now, I have to let you know, I am biased. I think Andrew Yang is the best candidate based on several of his economic policies. But when it comes to measuring who won the name recognition and brand recognition game, there is one thing that I always go to after these debates, and that has to be Google. The great thing about Google is it lets us know what normal people think. That's the people who aren't necessarily too politically involved. They're not going crazy on Twitter, or crazy on Reddit or YouTube. But when anyone wants to know something, they're going to go to Google and we can simply see who was the most trending candidate after the debate. So as you can see, number four is Andrew Yang. Funny, he went full influencer on the debate stage tonight is the title. And let me show you the video that ever got everyone so riled up. And this is the reason why I think Andrew Yang did a ridiculously good job. In America today, everything revolves around the almighty dollar. Our schools, our hospitals, our media, even our government. It's why we don't trust our institutions anymore. We have to get our country working for us again instead of the other way around. We have to see ourselves as the owners and shareholders of this democracy rather than inputs into a giant machine. When you donate money to a presidential campaign, what happens? The politician spends the money on TV ads and consultants and you hope it works out. It's time to trust ourselves more than our politicians. That's why I'm going to do something unprecedented tonight. My campaign will now give a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month for an entire year to 10 American families, someone watching this at home right now. If you believe that you can solve your own problems better than any politician, go to yang2020.com and tell us how $1,000 a month will help you do just that. This is how we will get our country working for us again, the American people. Mayor Pete Buttigieg. It's original, I'll give you that. <laughs> now, did you see the reactions on everyone's face? First of all, crowd confusion, clapter, um, like surprise, some people just didn't even react. And the reactions on stage, literal laughing from this girl. Like she is just, she cannot contain herself. Pete Buttigieg gives a very smirky, swarmy uh, remark. It's original, I will give you that. Andrew Yang went on this big, big hype train of saying that there's going to be a big surprise in his opening statement. And that big surprise ended up being that, you know, he's going to give 10 people a thousand dollars, basically a freedom dividend test run this year if they just sign up for his newsletter, basically on his campaign website. Now, at first I was digesting this, this news and I was like, this doesn't seem that impactful. This doesn't seem that news worthy. Like it's a really weird angle for Andrew Yang to take this as his opening statement of, you know, here's this guy talking about freedom dividends for all, but in his big announcements, I'm going to give free dividend right now to 10 people. But the more I really thought about it, and then when I saw Google Trends that he was literally the highest trending candidate again on another debate stage, and it was after his opening statement, I realized the genius of this move. You see, the one thing that Andrew Yang's platform is really missing is one word. Hitting that like button, making sure to subscribe so you can get these videos three days a week. <laughs> No, I'm just playing, but no, seriously, hit that like button. It really helps this video. But what Andrew Yang's platform is really missing is one word that is controversy. Controversy. As you can see, this is a chart that really shows who talked the most throughout the debate. And clearly, you can see Joe Biden is the person that leads the charge. And at the bottom is Andrew Yang, literally getting half of the speaking time as Joe Biden. 
Now, why does these things happen? The first reason is because, of course, if you're a politician, that is because you have political ties, you have connections, you have people who voted for you, you have a lot of ties in powerful places, they're gonna get you speaking time, they're gonna get you the questions that you want to be asked, they're gonna vet you and let you know what you're gonna say and what you can't say. They're gonna get you your speaking time in minutes. Yang is not a politician, he doesn't have these connections, so of course, he's not gonna have that type of favor when it comes to speaking time. But the second and more bigger reason why, because if you remember, Donald Trump was not a politician, he got crazy amounts of speaking time, is because of that word controversy. When you're controversial, when there's problems, when there are stories around you, it is easier to create a narrative around you as a TV producer or a show creator. Because Joe Biden is the most recognizable person, it is so easy to create all of these interesting narratives about Joe Biden on stage. Oh, Joe Biden versus Kamala Harris. Joe Biden versus Bernie Sanders, who has a better health care plan. Joe Biden, like every narrative they want to create is with Joe Biden because that is what's going to interest the viewers. One of the biggest complaints after the debate was it was boring. I've heard, seen this a lot throughout online. A lot of people who actually watched the three hours found it boring. And it is the show producer's little, little job to make it as interesting and entertaining as possible. These people are talking about economic theory. Not a lot of people are economic enthusiasts. So when they really start talking about their policies and politics and economics, a lot of people start zoning out and they only zone back in when their favorite candidate comes along. So to make it more interesting to people, you throw a bunch of these controversial storylines in there and all of a sudden you care about Joe Biden's beef with everybody. That's why at every opportunity, Castro was taking as much shots at Joe Biden as he could because this pushes his storyline and it makes it easier for all of these news organizations, these TV channels, these YouTube clips that go viral. It makes it easy to cover them and easy to get people interested and excited about Castro. So Andrew Yang, in his very limited time, was able to create these storylines and these narratives about him and increase his name recognition and his brand recognition. And right now, Andrew Yang has the biggest presence on essentially all of these social media platforms. And it's about time he starts really mobilizing them by creating haters. Andrew Yang needs haters. That's because haters do something magical that just people who support Andrew Yang can't necessarily do. They start conversations. Now all of a sudden, anytime I see anyone write anything negative online about Andrew Yang, finally haters are there. So now the people who are on his side, because he literally has the most passionate supporters out right now, anytime there's anyone discrediting any of his policies online, which finally there's starting to be more of, now all of his passionate supporters can start educating him on this platform. Another thing that happens is a lot of times the people who actually vote don't vote necessarily based on watching a political debate. They really learn about candidates from second and third hand information about the candidates. That's why brand and name recognition is so important. Kamala Harris, what is her main platform? I know her brand is she used to be a prosecutor, a lawyer, but what is her platform? Cory Booker, what is he known for? What is his main platform point? With Bernie Sanders, his brand is so easy. I wrote the damn bill, the one percenters and the 99,000 percenters. It's over 9,000 percenters taking the one percent of the five percent. Yeah, I, I'm never running for president. I did not. I don't know what that was. That was a terrible impersonation. Bernie last year came strong at income inequality. He came strong at corporate Democrats. He came strong at the establishment and the money in politics and his platform was very easy to identify and it's funny how like everyone literally started absorbing his platform points so a lot of people who never necessarily watched bernie last year were informed by his passionate supporters who told someone who told someone who finally told them and they heard oh bernie he's that uh that uh yeah he's that guy getting rid of all of school debt right i think i heard about him yeah 
Then last year when people started calling Bernie a socialist and he's gonna get rid of all jobs in America because he's giving all the power back to the government, corporations are gonna get slaughtered, this guy is evil socialist. The haters were screaming his platform points on a pedestal, but the neutral people were thinking that social programs aren't that bad and that's not really socialism, that's still capitalism. So not only those positive people spreading Bernie's messages were really helping him out, but also it was the negative people spreading Bernie's message out there and having the people who were in the middle, didn't know who to vote for, saying, you know what? Actually, that's not really socialism. That's actually just a part of capitalism. Let me vote for Bernie because that platform point actually kind of makes sense to me. So with Yang, him talking about giving a thousand dollars to just instead of everybody, that's what he's gonna do when he actually wins in 2020, him giving it to 10 people now started creating a buzz. And while now people have some great Yang jokes, they're like, oh, this guy's like a YouTuber. He's like a social influencer. He's not a serious candidate giving $1,000 to 10 people. And he thinks he, when he wins, he's going to give $1,000 to everyone. What a joke. That will never happen. The haters are screaming this on a pedestal. But guess what? Those neutral people, those people in the middle, all they're hearing is like, wait, he's planning to give a freedom dividend to $1,000 to me forever for the rest of my life? Wait. Let me let me go to andrewyang2020.com and really re let, me, let me understand his platform a little bit. Again, I really liked Andrew Yang's healthcare argument. It was really good how he articulated. I liked it. But again, it created that beautiful thing, that controversy, and it allows brand recognition. Listen to this one. And I believe we're talking about this the wrong way. As someone who has run a business, I know that our current healthcare system makes it harder to hire people, makes it harder to give them benefits and treat them as full-time employees. You instead pretend they're contractors. It's harder to change jobs. It's certainly harder to start a business. The pitch we have to make the American people is we will get the healthcare weight off of your backs and then unleash the hopes and dreams of the American people. Senator Becker, now, I am Asian, so I know a lot of doctors. And they tell me that they spend a lot of time on paperwork, avoiding being sued, and navigating the insurance bureaucracy. We have to change the incentives so instead of revenue and activity, people are focused on our health in the healthcare system. And the Cleveland Clinic, where they're paid not based upon how many procedures they prescribe, shocker, they prescribe fewer procedures, and patient health stays the same or improves. That is the pitch to the American people. Senator Booker, close out this discussion. Thank you very much. So I generally have two thoughts about Andrew Yang's talk when he talks about healthcare. The first one is back to that controversy part. It builds that brand recognition. He talks about I'm Asian and I know a lot of doctors. And I've seen this throughout a lot of YouTube comments, people commenting about it, a lot of Reddit, a lot of Twitter. And my reaction to this is yes, baby, lean in to being Asian. You think Obama wasn't leaning into being black? You think Hillary Clinton wasn't leaning into being a woman? You didn't think Donald Trump was leaning into being rich and a celebrity and being famous? Like I've seen so many viral videos of just Obama shaking like white people's hands, shaking their hands, shaking their hand. And as soon as he sees a black person, he's like, yo, what up, what up, baby? Yo, baby, yo, yo, baby, yo, baby, yo, baby. <laughs> Well, minus, minus that kissing part, but you get what I mean, hopefully. As the only Asian American running in the race, Yang, this is an easy way to brand yourself and an easy way to distinguish yourself on different policy points. And also does a great job in creating controversy online where people are like, why is he bringing up that he's Asian? And it gives another opportunity for his super rambunctious, energetic fan base online to start educating people on his policies and platform points. The big second thing that I really took from his talk about healthcare and just what in the whole healthcare section in general is we need to get money the out of politics. Not once did anyone really mention the fact that drugs in America cost way more than they do in Canada and the same drug will cost way more than it does in the UK. And this is because those drug companies are literally advertising. <laughs> they're, they're literally advertising during the debate. When money's in politics, it makes it so hard, so hard to go against these multi big pharma corporations because they're literally fundraising and backing 
these candidates. Andrew Yang is an outsider. He doesn't have any ties to his company, so he can start addressing the real problems. Everyone's incentives are messed up. You know what happens to a company when their CEO is not getting paid by the long-term performance of that company? Guess what? He gets short-term incentives and he's not incentivized to do the best. That's why the CEOs get paid most of their salary in stock and stock options that only can mature for them being like three years in the company and if the company hits a certain target like seven years from now. That's how you pay a CEO in having an incentive plan that aligns the people with what they want and the corporations with what they want is the only way that we're actually going to get real progress when it comes to American healthcare. One of Yang's best proposals, and this is honestly one of my favorite things from his platform, and I'll probably end up doing a whole video eventually about this. One of his best proposals that he's performing proposing on his platform is this. Losing to the fossil fuel companies. Yeah. Why are we losing to the gun lobby and the NRA? And the answer is this. We all know, everyone on the stage knows, that our government has been overrun by money and corporate interests. Now, everyone here has a plan to try and curb those corporate interests, but we have to face facts. Money finds a way. Money will find its way back in. So what is the answer? The answer is to wash the money out with people-powered money. My proposal is that we give every American 100 democracy dollars that you can only give to candidates and causes that you like. This would wash out the lobbyist cash by a factor of eight to one. That is the only way we will win. And as someone running for president, I'll tell you, there's a people on one side and the money on the other. The only way for us to win is if we bring them together. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Lisa. Yes, finally, man, like get the money out of politics. The politicians can't go after the real issues. If the people who are giving them millions of dollars are literally telling them, do not talk bad about big pharma, do not talk bad about the big banks, and do not talk bad about the gun companies because we're funding your campaign and we'll cut that funds and you'll have to fire a hundred people in your office and you won't be able to make all those different stops around the country that you want. You better listen up. Finally, an actual proposal to really get the money out of politics. Now, when it really comes to everyone else, um, I did write down a couple notes of like what I really liked from everyone else and what really they did well. Biggest surprise, I think Castro did an amazing job. He came out Biden, got those controversial moments, got those highlight clips, and he sounded very presidential. Like he sounded like very confident in everything he was saying. He was able to compare and contrast his ideas and come out sounding ahead a bit. What the? Wait, what's that on my? Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Don't get cyber jumped. Make sure you protect your IP because predators can see it. Know where you live, know all your stuff, protect yourself, get NordVPN in the description link below. And yeah, Castro was, he, he was good. Cory Booker, as I said before, super strong candidate, just came out looking very presidential, very confident, very passionate. Like when he talked about the gun debate, it was very passionate. When he talked about inequality in America, I remember him making one line that was like, we got more black people in prison now than we did have slaves in the 1700s. Like I thought that was like a good way to really put stuff in perspective of how many people are in, how many black people are in prison. Now Elizabeth Warren, I remember um, hearing about her from the Young Turks like eight or 10 years ago, like a, a long time ago. I always thought she was a great candidate and she's doing well. She's kind of teaming up with Bernie Sanders, it feels like. And I really like what she said on education. I, I think overall, she's a very strong candidate. Kamala Harris did well, you know, she's a prosecutor. So I expect her reform on prisons and stuff like that to be strong. And I never really got this like, it sucks that Tulsi's not in this debate because I thought she was amazing. But to me, th this whole controversy about her old record and how, you know, Tulsi really crushed it. In theory, it's supposed to be a bad look on Kamala Harris. And to give context, essentially, Kamala Harris was a prosecutor. She locked up a bunch of black people back in her day as a prosecutor. So Tulsi, she called that out. Tulsi, of course, is another Democratic candidate. Called that out on stage. Harris looked embarrassed and it was clips going everywhere. But at the end of the day, like, like, am I the only one that has to say it? Kamala Harris 
is black. Most people, when they hear that she was tough on crime against black people, hear that she's someone who's not biased just because she's black. She will go hard on black people. And she has the and not only does she have the best interests of black people, but she has the best interests of everyone, of Americans. Like this whole weird lane of trying to paint her out to be someone who like really screwed over black people back in the day is just not it's just not really a great attack on her. It, it, it doesn't make sense. And it's basically like a fly bite that she can basically like rub off her shoulders easily. Obviously, black people are not a monolith. And some of them, some people are going to some people are really going to take issues with her records. But there's a lot of people who really understand nuance and understand the situation that she was put in and really believe that she has the best interests of black people in mind if she becomes president. Beto O'Rourke. Now, Beto, every time Beto speaks, it's something honestly amazing. I'd probably give him like, if I had to really rank him, I'd rank him high up there, like top five. Like for someone who didn't really speak in the debate that much, every time he talked, especially when it was on racism or what, or that big mass shooting that happened in his home state, Beto sounded confident, he sounded knowledgeable, and he was one of the people who really was championing for reparations for black people. Now, of course, 70% of America is white people so you know having a platform that's really based on helping black people isn't necessarily something that will get you elected but when he was saying it he was saying it in a very passionate compassionate way he was strong with what he was saying and this is really putting like the well-being of black people in america on the political debate stage and it's interesting how beto's taking this angle and really standing behind a platform point that may not necessarily even get him elected but it, he really sounds passionate about everything he said. I say, honestly, great job. Of course, we've been talking about Bernie Sanders a little bit. Um, interesting thing about Bernie, and I think he's definitely like, I think Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are the clear front runners of this debate right now. Andrew Yang, I think, is going to catch up and actually win this thing. But Bernie Sanders, it's insane. His ideas were so radical when he was going against Hillary Clinton. And now it seems that every single candidate has copies or took a bit of his platform. And now his ideas sound more normal. I think that automatically puts him as the front runner because how can you take Bernie's idea and make it better when Bernie Sanders himself laid the foundation for this idea to even be possible, clearly Bernie's have been a very consistent candidate. He's thought, hopefully, about his platform a long time. I would naturally think that his thoughts on the health care or his thoughts on how he wants to spend the budget or how he wants to tax Wall Street, I would feel that his plants, when he says stuff, has the most weight behind it because he had the ideas first and he would probably be the best to go about implementing those. Now, if we had to pick one loser, one loser of this debate, it is so easy. All you have to do is honestly just just look at this clip like it. it like what? Why is he here? Vice President, I want to come to you and talk to you about inequality in schools and race. In a conversation about how to deal with segregation in schools back in 1975, you told a reporter, I don't feel responsible for the sins of my father and grandfather. I feel responsible for what the situation is today, for the sins of my own generation. And I'll be damned if I feel responsible to pay for what happened 300 years ago. You said that some 40 years ago. But as you stand here tonight, what responsibility do you think that Americans need to take to repair the legacy of slavery in our country? Well, they have to deal with the, the look, there is institutional segregation in this country. Ay, 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 man, like, mm. Now, I didn't want to cut him off and I want to like let him say the whole thing, but his whole answer and response is around two minutes and he doesn't necessarily answer directly on why he thought that then and what is different about his thoughts now. And overall, Joe Biden, every time he's answering a question, as you can see, it's it's like he doesn't know the words he wants to say. He sounds more aggressive, more angry, less composed. And overall, I just feel like he wasn't necessarily confident in the things that he was saying. Like he didn't necessarily was able to really rebuttal to any attacks. He didn't really have any like policy points that it could he could um, go to. Like his whole strategy of running right now is just to say, I love Barack Obama. I worked for him. And when they ask him about an Obama point, it's to say, hey, I was only the vice president, so I wasn't in charge of that. It's like you can't really have it both ways. Like, like, I don't know what your platform is. 
But all in all, that's what I think about the debates. Remember, if you like this video, hit that like button. I'm telling you, it really helps out the channel. It helps this videos go out there. If you're listening to this on a podcast, make sure you write a five star review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to it. It really helps out the algorithms, guys. And remember, the best, most brightest investors are the uneducated ones. Why is that? That's because the uneducated investors, they never stop. The Uneducated Investor Podcast. I love you guys. And remember to catch my videos three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We do economic videos, political investing, connecting that to pop culture. And we, Flight Crew, have to take off.